Hi, I'm Rich Laveau. At Bloomfield College, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868. Qual Care Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. The Russell Berry Foundation, Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Steve Adubato here. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Atkins, who is director of New Jersey Health Initiatives, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, also associate professor at Rutgers University in Camden. Good to see you, Bob. Yeah, thanks for having me. We worked together uh, over in Jersey City. Yeah. Tell folks what that was, and then we'll bring it over to Camden. What that, was that? That was fun. It was an opportunity for the foundation to launch and talk about its really ambitious plan to build a culture of health in New Jersey and the nation. And so it was a really an opportunity just to kind of start talking about what that was and bring in some really important thought leaders around that, and it was just a great event. And the culture of health is, uh, uh, which we'll talk about as being led by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I always say full disclosure, you're underwriting programming on our partners, mm -hmm. for our partners at NJTV and right. for us as well, promoting and dealing with this culture of health. What is it and why is it so important? Hmm. I think the culture of health is a, is a logical next step of where the foundation has been driving towards. So the Robert Johnson Foundation has been very interested in understanding how uh, where we work, play, live, and learn affects our health uh, and our health chances and our health opportunities. And so. In the social determinants of health, they're a piece of that also, but this culture of health really brings in that idea of, you know, how do we create this opportunity, this e equal opportunity for all individuals to make choices and take opportunities and, and change how they live so that they live mm. healthier lives. And we're doing this program literally right after President Obama mm. um, comes to Camden to talk about some positive things going on between the police and the community. But, right. And when that's part of the culture of health, but right, right. more precisely. Right. The, health, the health of the folks in Camden, particularly the younger people. Right, right. I mean, so it's great you talk about the younger people in Camden because I, uh, I kind of got my start you know in Camden. Don't, yeah. I know talk Camden. about your connection uh, to Camden. Camden. So I, I came to Camden. I grew up in Cherry Hill, which is only a couple miles from Camden geographically, but a big jump socioeconomically. And I came to Camden fresh out of nursing school. Uh, I became a school nurse there. I was about 26 years old, and it's this place where I ended up buying a house. Right. I met my wife, I had my first child, uh, I worked there, I started a youth development group there, and I uh, felt a very close connection to this place, which is, in many ways, it's, it's a place that's like, and like Cherry Hill. I mean, you have parents there and people there that uh, want to raise their families and have kids there, really want to have interesting and um, constructive adulthoods, um, but there's these barriers that kind of get in the way, and then Camden really brings you kind of face-to-face kind of -face what these barriers are. Um, you know, one of the big barriers in Camden is, is you have, um, and they're all, they're all interwoven, right? So you have barriers into the school system, and you have barriers in the housing, and you have barriers in terms of where people can buy fresh fruit, fruit and produce and things like that. Um, and, and they all kind of interact with each other to make it really challenging. And so with um, one of the things that I saw as a, as a school nurse and working with youth there is one of the barriers is that there's a lot of opportunities for kids to make mistakes. Mm. Um, it's, almost, it's almost hard to play the perfect game in Camden because there's always, um, there's always something that, that occurs that's really not in their control that can really kind of sidetrack and derail them. Um, and, you, and you saw that. You saw that in Camden. You saw these kids that were really challenged to kind of just you know, pick a path that was going to lead them to this healthy, constructive adulthood um, that we really want for kids. And so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation decides to do what? 
Let's talk about this. Yeah, so the foundation has really kind of really leaned into this idea of how do we think about health in ways that involve not just the absence of illness, but really the kind of the opportunity to get healthy. And this is such an exciting idea because it, it really kind of speaks to these fundamental democratic ideas about um, equity, mm. equality of opportunity, social justice. I mean, so these are really exciting kind of ideas. That, that that's what this country was founded on. That's what, yeah. So these, so these, this is, you know, it's supposed to be what right. makes our country so great. Right, right. I mean, and Supposedly. I think, yeah, and if we're going to have a pursuit of <laughs> happiness, right, in these kinds of things, we I have read to about have, that somewhere. Yeah, we, we, told, we used to talk about that, but life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, yeah, right? it all requires health. It all requires people to be able to kind of make healthy, make healthy choices and live healthier lives. I mean, it's something that, it's one thing to tell people, oh, eat well, get enough exercise, right. go see your provider. It's another thing to talk about how do we create the opportunities so you can do those things. So the foundation has picked 10 communities so, yes, so the foundation to target your new, resources yeah. to right. do what? Describe this. Right, through the New Jersey Health Initiatives, which is... The New Jersey Health Initiatives, go ahead. Yeah, New Jersey Health Initiatives is a, a, a program of the foundation, a statewide grant-making program of the foundation. And in some ways, it's a, a very um, great reflection of the foundation's commitment to the state of New Jersey, right? So it's been 30 years uh, the foundation has, through the New Jersey Health Initiatives, funded programs, community-based organizations, institutions, individuals in the state to improve health and well-being in the state. And so New Jersey Health Initiatives, which I have the pleasure of directing, really kind of follows where the foundation's priorities are. And where they, those foundation's priorities are, New Jersey Health Initiatives gives funding to community-based organizations. And obviously the foundation's priority right now, as you just talked about, is building a culture of health. And so building a culture of health is starting right here in New Jersey. Right. We're going to fund 10 communities throughout the state who are going to really work across sectors. I mean, so it's, it's bringing faith-based groups, elected officials, um, schools, higher education, social service and, and health service agencies, hospitals, foundations, all coming together in their community and really working and sitting down and thinking, what do we need to do to make our city healthier? So our city being Atlantic City or Salem or Camden. Or Orange, New Jersey. Or Orange, which is a really exciting proposal because that's where the, the lead agency in that community is a school. That's right, the Orange Public Schools. Orange Public Schools. Or Irvington, the township of Orange. Or yeah. in Salem, the as you of said. Newark, yeah, or Salem County, yeah. out in the middle of uh, Which is the United Way of uh, Salem County or Elizabeth, New Jersey, right outside of Newark. Uh, Morristown, mm -hmm. New Jersey. Right. Jersey City. So many 10 locations. Right. Uh, and Morristown pick, picked one census tract within Morristown, one census tract which is distressed, which needs a lot of help, which is only has 6,000 people in it, but they are going to focus on how do we move the needle yeah. in this one community. And so that's uh -huh. really exciting, one, basically one neighborhood. How long does this go on for, and when are you going to look at it in terms of say, hey, how successful have we been with this? Yeah, so the first step of this program is what we're going to do is, is these communities are going to get together. They've identified their teams, they've identified their different sectors that they're going to engage in this, and they're going to develop a blueprint. They're going to you know, receive some of some of our research resources and leadership training. They're going to develop a blueprint to think about what do we want to do in this community? There's so many things we can do, but what would be most important first step in here? And that's in year one. And then years two, three, and four, mm. we're going to be providing um, funding to help them take this plan they've had and, and, and implement that plan. Um, and, and for us, it's really going to be important because it's going to allow us to build capacity. And because we're grant makers, we always think about how do we fund those individuals who can make the biggest difference in their communities. And to be clear, those of us in public broadcasting will be tracking, following, uh, reporting on and analyzing uh, those results and making sense of them for the public. Yeah. Uh, last question for you. I'm curious about this. Uh, two, two quickies here. Um, first of all, what would you say your greatest leadership lesson you've learned so far in all this is? You've dealt with all kinds of mm. situations. Number one leadership lesson is? Great. The number one leadership lesson is relationships matter. Relationships, relationships, relationships. It's all about the relationships. So as a, as a school nurse, it was relationships I made with these kids and their families and, and the other individuals that really were trying to support them. As a, as a, as a, um, as a, as a, somebody that started a community-based organization in Camden, you know, when I started this Camden STAR program, which was, STAR program stands for Sports Teaching Adolescents Responsibility and Resilience. And so we worked starting in 1995 to 2010 we worked with kids in Camden, hundreds and hundreds of kids, and tried to provide them opportunities to get mm -hmm. play soccer, which we thought was important, but also do uh, civic engagement through community service, and also do things like academic enrichment. And when I started the program, I was a, I was a young school nurse in Camden. Um, when I started, I thought it was all going to be about the money. 
I said, we're going we're gonna to need money. Um, and I'm going to be happy, you know, so I, um, but the money was easy. The money, getting people to write checks. What was checks. the hard part? Hard part was getting people to come and be able to, you know, engage in this. Work with adolescents. Work with adolescents. That's hard. I mean, because adolescents, you know, they're, they're in an age when, you know, we kind of start to kind of push them away. They don't smell as good. Their language gets to be a little bit salty. Um, we, and we're less willing to engage with them. But, you know, as we were able to bring in people that were caring, consistent adults that show up every day and make a difference in their lives, those relationships made the difference. Never, never yeah. the money. The money was always easy to get. It's good stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, you also told the producer, we'll talk about this another time, um, this may be the first generation of younger people not yeah. as healthy as the previous one. Right? Yeah, isn't that astounding? Yeah. That's scary. Yeah, it is scary. And we'll yeah. talk about that next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, thank you. Good stuff. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Be right back right after this. Thanks. That's important. Yeah, thanks. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined uh, by John R. Latka, Senior Vice President, Electric and Gas Operations. You heard of this company, psc and Good to see you. Thanks for inviting me, Steve. Let's talk uh, not just energy. Let's talk, people don't talk infrastructure. But it's important, especially after Hurricane Sandy. Why was Sandy a game changer in the infrastructure world? So let me let me just give you a little bit of background about uh, you know storms and, and, and you know what we've experienced over the last couple of years. Since 2011, PSEG experienced some of the most destru destructive storms in its history. Um, you know, Sandy being the, being the one that changed the game completely. Uh, two million customers out of service. Um, you know, half of those customers, almost half of those customers were affected by the flooding of the stations. We had a four to eight foot surge uh, that came through the stations and affected the equipment, obviously flooded the equipment. So w with that, um, the improvement, in inf we saw the, the keys moving forward was the improvement in the infrastructure. So let's define, we're using the word infrastructure. Right. Like our executive producer happens to live in the Hoboken area and she was affected differently than a lot of the rest of us because her infrastructure is like mass transit. Her infrastructure is the streets that are flooded and you can't get through them. But that's different than the Jersey Shore. My point is, infrastructure is different to different people. What does that mean? So, so in the case of psc and G, we're talking about the transmission infrastructure, the, the stuff that feeds from other parts of the state. We're talking about the distribution infrastructure, gas and electric, that actually feed the local homes, feed the substations to the local homes. The sub, what's a substation? So a substation is no different than uh, the breaker panel at your house, right? The breaker okay. panel at your house feeds all the different rooms. I think I know where that is. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know where it is. So, so it feeds all the different rooms in your house, right? The yeah. kitchen, the bathrooms. And, and those breakers basically do the same thing in a substation. So that's a substation? That's a substation. So what goes on in that substation that if that has a flood, there's a problem? So in the, in the case of Sandy, uh, the flood was four to eight feet high. It got into the equipment, basically waterlogged the equipment. The only way you can restore that station is to go back in there, dry everything out, and basically clean all the equipment back up before you can actually energize it. Wow. And now, is that part of like, drying it out, cleaning out, all that, is that part of, John, the so-called Energy Strong program? That, that is exactly what Energy Strong is all about. Energy That's Strong. That's PSE and G's Energy Strong Energy program. Energy Strong program. It, it, it really entails taking 29 of those substations that were affected by the floods, Raising or relocating them, right? Or eliminating them completely. Why, why? Raising them because of potential flooding. Raising, right. Relocating, why? Just to, just to actually take them out of the floodplain. Take them out. But, oh, are you saying that with all these storms, but the, the big one, the game changer being Sandy, teaching us, hey, they're not supposed to be there in the first place? The, they, obviously, for 75 years, they've had no problem. But now we Sand, know how bad Sandy knows be. there could be an issue, right? So we move them. We, we eliminate them, and we actually move the load to another area, to another substation. What does it do for the consumers? The consumer actually, you know, during the next storm, that flooding will not be, you know, it will not happen in that station. They'll be above the floodplain. Uh, you know, we're going FEMA plus one in most of our stations. i got to ask you something. For, for, for you and your colleagues, I don't want to go backwards, but, you know, as we do this program, we're going to the summer of 2015. What was it like for you, Sandy? Oh, Sandy, Sandy was uh, a, a long two weeks. It was a long two weeks. It, it, you know, 
the, the stress on, on the families at home, obviously, you know, there were a lot of uh, employees that didn't have, you know, places to go. You know, their, their, their homes were flooded. Uh, we, we certainly had issues with, you know, just getting to and from work. Yeah. Fuel became an issue, right? We, we had just places to stay. There were no hotels left in, in right. New Jersey. So, so it, it's a hardship for everyone. So, you know, you come in every day. You know, we had Hurricane Irene, right? Hurricane Irene. We thought that was bad. We thought that was bad. That was one week, right? One week. So after a week uh, of Sandy, yeah. we thought, all right, we still have a million customers out. Nah, so this that was really, Irene. In fact, when we had Ralph LaRosa, uh, your colleague at PSE and G, one of the things he talked a lot about that I want you to talk about is trying to improve customer communication. Right. That's been a big thing at your company. Your social media operation, Facebook and Twitter, has really expanded dramatically. Why? I, I think it's the push that we've made in, in, since Sandy, right, since, uh, since Irene. We have made um, you know, some significant improvements in that area. Basically, Facebook and, and even Twitter has actually exploded. If you look at our Twitter accounts right now, there are about 90,000 uh, Twitter accounts. And, and really... How are you using it? Because our producers were just saying as we got in here, hey, because I said, well, you know, what do you call? What do you do? A lot of them were saying they got information about what was going on and where they were in terms of service with you guys from following Twitter. Right. Like you were actually communicating who had service and where, like, town by town. Right. And, and, and then at some time, there, there were points where customers were telling us, oh, our lights are back on. And we... We actually knew it faster from Twitter sometimes because the, you know, the folks in the field weren't you know, communicating right away. And, and, and the customer would tell you, oh, the lights just came back on. Great. Yay, PSE and J. Does it change the entire, does the way, the way people communicate today via social media, has it changed communication forever? And by the way, what about people who are not on social media? There's a whole generation of people who are not sitting there going, hey, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. They're not thinking that way. So what about them? Right, so, so you know, we, we offer a couple of different avenues, right? So you, you have the cell phone, you have text messaging, you can certainly choose that. You can certainly use just to get a plain old telephone call, right, a, at your house, and, and you know, you can certainly uh, communicate with us like that. So we offer a couple of different options. We offer the internet now. We just upgraded our, um, our outage maps last year. So you can go online, you go into the internet, you can look at some more detailed information about the outages. Yeah, let's talk about kids for a second. Uh, the other thing I learned uh, over this past year is your company has also collaborated with the Children's Television Network. We're very close to them as well. The, P the folks at PSG hooked up with Sesame Street folks. Uh, I know that that is that. That's not Elmo, is it? Is that's it? Elmo. That is Elmo. Okay. Yeah, it is Elmo. It's Elmo. Because actually, there's a there's a spot, a PSA spot on it. We're running on our partners uh, with NJTV on the news with Ralph Rosa, talking about safe. Talk, talk about that a re readiness in case of an emergency. With, with Ralph and Elmo talking to kids and parents about readiness. There it is, let's get ready. Talk about that. This is a, just a great program, a great app for, for parents that they can use to, to teach their kids how to prepare for emergencies. You know, it, it lets them go in and, and show the kids about, um, you know, their phone numbers, their names, you know, where they live, and, and lets them be prepared for the emergencies that we're gonna have. And Sesame Street's a great partner Sesame to do anything with. a great with. partner. Uh, give me 30 seconds on summer months. So our month's coming. Uh, maintenance is all done. We've uh, been patrolling with our helicopters. We're doing hotspot infrared inspections. Uh, so we just got a lot of good stuff going on. July uh, and August, but people, they, they're thinking, okay, other things could happen um, in terms of outages. They still stay in touch with you guys in terms of finding out what? July and August just become uh, the summer months of, of more communication with our customers. And stay on that website, PSENG? .com is up there. PSENG.com. Listen, John Latka, who is Senior Vice President, Electric and Gas Operations, PSENG. Uh, not a lot of pressure. <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it. A lot of pressure, and uh, we're all counting on it. Thanks so much, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Stay right Thanks, there, man. Uh, one on one, we'll be right back right after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined by Kevin Chittenden, who is a New Jersey Regional Sales Manager, Wells Fargo. Good to see you, Kevin. Good to see you, Steve. Ready to talk about home ownership? I am. All right. My you favorite topic. I, 
Because? Because good things are happening in New Jersey. Prove it. Well, the, the employment rate is getting better. Uh, people are finding jobs. The, uh, the demand for home ownership is, is rising, which is great. The, uh, the need for home ownership is rising. Builders are optimistic. There's a lot of good things to be happy about. You're bullish. I am. I am. I think we've come through a couple of years where things have been um, pro a little flat. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be a roaring year, but I think mo we're looking for modest gains for sure. Well, let's talk about this. Uh, assume everything you're saying is true, but the question becomes getting access to capital. Well, access to the mortgage. You mm -hmm. get the mortgage loan. Yep. I'm not convinced everybody really understands what it is they need to have in place to put themselves in the best possible position to get approved. Break it down. Well, it's it's a great question. I think one of the things that we did, we uh, did a, a homeownership sur survey with millennials, and uh, we learned a lot. We learned a lot that there's a lot of myths out there about homeownership. One Name of them, one. one of them being that a lot of millennials felt they needed 20 percent down to buy a house. You don't need 20 percent. You don't need 20 percent. What do you need? Um, minimum down. There's uh, programs through Fannie Mae and FHA that uh, requires little down is three percent. Three. Three percent. Yep. And that makes uh, home ownership a lot more achievable for many people that want to own. Yeah, but you have to qualify for that. You do. You do. And it's, it's not any different than qualifying for any other mortgage. Uh, you still have uh, credit requirements, you have income requirements, and certainly you do have some asset requirements as well. Is it, but let's play this out then. If someone can, question, if someone can put 20 down, mm -hmm. are they better off putting the 20 down, carrying less, in mortgage and um, mortgage payments and the the, uh, the interest payments, not to mention, I don't know, you may have heard property taxes are pretty high in New Jersey, uh, or putting the 3% down and carrying more? It's a great question. It's individual. So I would tell you that if you have the money, so you have sufficient reserves, you have, uh, the you rainy, have, you have a rainy day fund. Right. If you're going to exhaust all of your assets to put 20% down and you have no emergency funds, I would generally say that's probably not the best advice. So it's going to be a personal decision. Certainly putting more down is advantageous for a lower mortgage payment, which is, uh, which is a terrific, uh, you know, the, the lower the payment for most people, the better off they are. I hear some people, I had a friend the other day who said, you know, we went with the 15-year mortgage. I actually have it from Wells Fargo. Um, I went with the 15-year mortgage. Now they're complaining about the 15-year mortgage because, not because of you guys, it has nothing to do with you, but they didn't realize how much of a burden it would be. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what do you think the difference would be, to, be between a 30 conventional and a 15? You're paying more. That's right. Well, we wanted to pay it faster. Well, no kidding. How do you think you're going to do that without paying more every month? Right. Do you get that? A little bit. I think that most people, you know, we give them all the information to make an informed decision, and that's really what the most important thing is that the customer is informed and has the ability to make a choice. Um, certainly, there's a great advantage for 15 years. You're out of the uh, out of the debt faster. You're building equity faster. The advantages of a 30-year are certainly more affordability, more uh, take-home pay. Sure. Uh, you know, there's a lot more advantages. Advantage to that. either way is what you're saying. Absolutely, and and uh, we do see a lot of people right now with rates where they are going. 15 year because they they just don't want to have debt for a long period. Talk of time. about the rates. Uh, rates are good. The rates are uh, still historically low. Um, 15 years are in the threes. Uh, 30 years are right around four. So still very good. Talk home prices. Home prices are pretty stable. Um, in the southern part of the state, I think we see a little bit more challenge. Uh, you know, down around the Atlantic City market. Um, in the northern part of the state, it's uh, there's a lot of optimism. A lot we're starting to see some appreciation, especially in the Hudson County market where mm. things are hot, and, and a little bit of pockets throughout the northern part of the state. We're down. Uh, we actually are doing some. Uh, I shouldn't disclose too much. Down at the Jersey Shore area. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you something. I thought post Sandy, hey, what a deal. Mm, not, not, a lot of deals. Not, not everywhere. No. Where we wound up, they were like, no, nah, no deal here because property was at a premium. That's right. What's up there? Location, location, <laughs> location, right? I mean. Yeah, that's why I'm not going to give up too much. Exactly. But I, I'm sitting there going, I was wrong. I was totally wrong. 
Well, I, we, the shores have held value because of the demand. I mean, certainly to have a shore home is a big deal. And New Jersey, shorelines are a terrific area of the country and, Still. and high demand. So we see people from Pennsylvania, New York, Canada um, buying, you know, looking to buy properties in, on the Jersey Shore. It's, it's a really great area. You know, the one thing I was curious about, I was thinking about this, credit score. The credit score issue, do most people know their credit score issue, A, excuse me, and B, um, do they knock over their glass when they find out what it is? <laughs> do, do, they, do they also realize that their credit score does have an impact on their ability to get a loan? I think with all the advertising today, um, whether it's creditscore.com or all these, uh, all these advertisements, I think a lot more people are, are aware of credit score. What I don't think is, I, I don't think people understand what is great credit or what's uh, average credit. And I think that's the part where we really want people to talk to a trusted advisor. Best advice for someone saying, this is the year. I want to buy my or our first home. Best advice. Um, to really understand your financial uh, picture. So understand your situation. Uh, talk to a mortgage consultant to really understand what you can afford. I think and that's- what you can't. And what you can't, right. Um, and there's a lot of people that uh, in, in back in you know, old days where you know, they would get mortgages without a lot of qualifications today, um, we are really, uh, the whole industry is, is looking deep into, into affordability, making sure people can afford homes. You love what you do. I do. Because I'm passionate about it. It's great. I, I get to help people achieve their dream every day. You really do? I do. It's, like, it's what I love. You like saying yes more than no. Absolutely. 25 years in the business uh, certainly makes me uh, proud to be part of it. I just want to plug one more time. Kevin Chindin is a New Jersey regional sales manager for uh, Wells Fargo. And uh, we're talking first time. Uh, home buyers and home ownership. A lot of myths out there. We're trying to get it right. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Bloomfield College, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Sharing Network, the Russell Berry Foundation. Choose New Jersey, and by Verizon Communications. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision. Because you can make a difference and save a life.